Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Mary Bergman, and on behalf of the festival committee, I'm delighted to welcome you to the sixth annual Nantucket Book Festival. We thank you all for being here, and we wouldn't be here if you didn't show up and you have showed up in mass. We're so thrilled. I also want to take a minute to thank our generous sponsors who make it possible for almost all of our events to be free and open to the public. And if you've been to a couple of these events, I know you've heard the speech before, but we are so thankful of those who help us um, continue these events, and they are Nantucket Island Resorts, Wendy Schmidt, the Nantucket Athenaeum, the Inquirer and Mirror, WCAI, and Magazine, Half Productions, the Nantucket Historical Association, and the Dreamland Theater. <clears throat> the year-round work of the Book Foundation, including the festival, would not be possible if not for the loyalty of our festival goers and our friends in attending and supporting us. We've got comment cards that you can fill out as you exit, and if we don't have your email address, you can put it on there so you can be added to our mailing list and you can find out about what's coming up next. After the presentation, um, Dr. Jameson and um, Megan Marshall will be signing their books back in the alcove there. They're available for purchase. I want to give you a minute to silence your cell phones. Ten seconds to silence your cell phones, please. I just heard a cell phone ding, so there's at least one person who needs to silence their cell phones. All right. And I'm really thrilled to introduce to you today Dr. K. Redfield Jameson, Megan Marshall, and Kate Tuttle. Dr. K. Redfield Jameson is a clinical psychologist and writer. She is professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she is co-director of the Mood Disorder Center, as well as honorary professor of English at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. She's the author of many books, including Robert Lowell, Setting the River on Fire, An Unquiet Mind, A Memoir of Moods and Madness, which was translated into 25 languages, Night Falls Fast, Understanding Suicide, and Touch with Fire, Manic Depressive Illness, and the Artistic Temperament. She is a leading authority on manic depressive illness, a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship, was named a Hero of Medicine by Time Magazine, and has won many awards for her work in the field of mental health. Pulitzer Prize winning writer Megan Marshall was a student of both poets Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop. Though a native of California, Marshall was drawn to the history of New England literary culture. She's the author of Elizabeth Bishop, A Miracle for Breakfast, Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, and The Peabody Sisters, The Women Who Ignited American Romanticism. Marshall has published essays and reviews in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times Book Review, and The London Review of Books, among others. She's received fellowships from the Dorothy and Louis B. Cullum Center for Scholars and Writers of the New York Public Library, John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for Humanities, and the Radcliffe Institute for, the Advanced, for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She teaches nonfiction writing and archival research at the, in the MFA program at Emerson College. She's an elected fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society and serves on boards of the Margaret Fuller Society and the Nathaniel Hawthorne Society, among others. Kate Tuttle is a writer, educator, excuse me, writer, editor, book critic, and contributing. Ugh. <laughs> I used to be a tour guide at the Capitol and I would speak to thousands of people. This is terrifying <laughs> because these people are so fantastic and I am so thrilled <laughs> that they are here and you are here. But anyway, Kate is a book critic, contributing two regular Sunday columns to the Boston Globe as the book columnist. She's the founding managing editor of the late Africana.com where she wrote and edited topics as diverse as news analysis, art reviews, interviews, and essays, both personal and political. She's overseen large academic editorial projects, including Encarta Africa and the African American National Biography, published by Oxford University Press. She has written for the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Atlantic Online, and Salon, to name just a few. And she currently serves as president of the National Book Credit Circle. Please join me in welcoming Dr. K. Redfield Jameson, Megan Marshall, and Kate Tuttle. Thank you. I, I think the format that we all agreed upon was that I would read um, for six or seven minutes and Megan would read about Bishop and then we would have, be interviewed. So what I would like to do is start with Robert Lowell, born in uh, Boston in 1917 and died uh, in 1977. And I just want to introduce you uh, via his own voice reading part of an uh, excerpted uh, Waking in the Blue. This is a poem that he, uh, Lowell struggled throughout his life. Uh, 20 hospitalizations for mania, very severe form of bipolar illness, very severe, as, 
the clinician, you rarely see anything quite so bad as what he had, very bad manias. This book poem was started in McLean Hospital during one of his uh, hospitalizations for mania, revised hugely, and it goes into many, many things, as Lowell always do, but I, I just want to say one thing. He, he, he talks in this poem about there is no protection from privilege. He was from a privileged background. Um, there's no protection from madness uh, because you are privileged. Uh, he was well aware that he was a Mayflower screwball. And he also, from the point of view of what I looked at in terms of his medical, his, his uh, daughter, Harriet Winslow Lowell, was kind enough to give me permission to, to um, track down his medical and psychiatric records. And one of the things that was most consistent and most heartbreaking was over and over again Lowell's terror of the madness coming back, uh, which it always did. Uh, it is a recurrent illness, and uh, it, it did come back. So I, I just want to start, if I could. Uh, as your day makes my agonized blue window bleaker, crows wander on the petrified fairway, absence. My heart grows tense as though a harpoon was sparring for the kill. This is the house for the mentally ill. Cough, waking in the blue. Oops. As your day makes my agonized blue window bleaker, Crows wander on the petrified fairway. <coughs> My heart grows tense as though a harpoon was sparring for the kill. <coughs> this is the house for the mentally ill. Cock of the walk, I strut in my turtle necked French sailor's jersey before the metal shaving mirrors. You see the shaky future grow familiar in the pinched indigenous faces of these thoroughbred mental cases, twice my age and half my weight. We are all old timers. Each of us holds a locked razor. Um, as uh, uh, most of you will know, there are two specific references to being on a psychiatric ward. One is a metal shaving mirror so that you can't break the glass and slice your wrists. Um, and the other is locked razors, um, that you cannot open the razor for the same reason. Um, my book is first foremost and always about Robert Lowell and about his work and his great poetry, but it's also a biography of an ancient illness, manic depressive illness as it was known in Lowell's time, uh, bipolar illnesses is more commonly known now, is an ancient illness. Mania was described long before Hippocrates, and Hippocrates described it very well, and melancholia as well. It was an illness that affected his life in almost every way, in his in terms of his thinking, in terms of his work, in terms of his relationships, in terms of everything that mattered to him, really. Um, but it's also a book, and, and the book is certainly discusses at great length the long-established uh, and even very recently many studies showing uh, the relationship between mood disorders and um, increased creativity. But it's also very much a book about character, and it's a book about Lowell's great will and discipline and his learning from the ancients and from poetry and about how to, to deal with adversity, how to deal uh, with life and hard work. It's also a book about friendship. He was a great friend, and he maintained his friendships till the end of his life, despite a devastating disease, and a great capacity for love. Um, I'd like to start with a letter, uh, some writing that Lowell did when he was 19 years old to Ezra Pound. And it's, it's, I, I want to focus a little bit today on Nantucket. So when, when Lowell was 19 years old, he wrote to Ezra Pound asking to study with him in Italy. He had ambition and nerve. He went after what he wanted, and he did this throughout his life. He said to Ezra Pound, he had never lived in the usual realities. He was proud, somewhat sullen, and violent. He said he chafed against the insipid blackness of the Episcopal Church, and in turn it had turned to, instead it turned to Zeus and Homer. Zeus's world was enticing, morally complex, 
and one that blinked at no realities. He had, he continued in his letter to Pound, spent a summer with two friends in Nantucket. He continued dedicating themselves to art. Their hours and habits had been strictly regimented, and by that I mean regimented by Lowell. Uh, no meals, no, no smoking, meals of grain, cooked eels, and honey. They had a very regimented lifestyle. They were there to serve God and to serve literature. They wrote and read Job, Wordsworth, Blake, Shakespeare, Coleridge, and they took high oaths to be serious in their work. By the end of their time in Nantucket, Lowell proclaimed that he had begun to understand God and had grown to love my art and those who were great in it. Lowell's novitiate summer in summers, actually two summers, in Nantucket, he explained to Pound, had changed the game. Since I have been sucking in atmosphere, reading and dreaming, writing and trying to help one or two friends, this has been the only real thing to me in my life. At college, he was a Harvard student at the time. I have yearned after iron and have been choked with cobwebs. No one here is really fighting. He ended his entreaty to pound in passion and a plea to be taken seriously. Your cantos, he wrote, have recreated what I have imagined to be the blood of Homer. Again, I ask you to have me. You shan't be sorry. I will bring the steel and fire. I am not theatrical. My life is sober, not sensational. So I want to just talk about a few elements of Lowell's mind. And he had an extraordinary mind, in addition to being, obviously, a remarkable poet. He was also a genius, a true genius in, in the old-fashioned, rare use of the word genius. But he had a seriousness of purpose. He had a vastness of expectation. He always assumed he would leave a mark, and he would paint on a broad canvas. He also had very strong oppositional forces in him, I mean, at the most extreme level, mania and depression, but also temperamentally, um, really dark forces and forces of, of great light. And he was an ambitious man. Uh, ambition seems to be a word that has a lot of uh, negative connotation uh, for some reason. He was ambitious, he delighted in the ambition, and his work reflects his ambition. Lowell's seriousness of purpose helped to frame his ambition, a wide capacity that spanned his expansive imagination and the manic illness that now and again would catapult him into delusion. Vaulting ambition had been his since childhood. Maddened grandiosities came to him later, first in ecstatic faith, and then in what he called mania's twists of fire. A great canvas was to be necessary for Lowell's work, one that yoked a passion for greatness with the vastness of scale he admired in other writers. Ambition tied these writers together, he felt, slung them upward, broke some. The archangel loved heights, Henry Adams wrote in Mount Saint-Michel and shot. Um, and Henry Adams was one of the great influences really throughout Lowell's um, intellectual life. So Adams said, standing on the summit of the tower that crowned his church, wings upspread, sword uplifted, the devil crawling beneath. St. Michael held a place of his own in heaven and on earth. His place was where the dangers were greatest. No one could touch, Henry Adams said, Lowell. And like Adam's archangel, Lowell loved heights, and he did not turn his back on danger. He would hold a place of his own. He would set the river on fire. He took his faith and the ambition by the poets he most admired and the writers. Pasternak, Lowell, Hawthorne, Melville, Whitman, Coleridge, all of them were habituated to the vast. They swung for the fences. Lowell was excited by greatness, didn't mind making mistakes, would much prefer to make mistakes than to repeat himself. Lowell's habitation of the vast, his friction of slides into history, and his comfort in the company of the great meant that he learned from great writers, historians, and epic heroes in a rare and immediate way. It placed him in an unbounded field under a high canopy. Um, and this is something that's really uh, 
absolutely consisted, and everyone who knew Lowell, was that if you were in the room and, and, and if he was teaching about a poet, it was as if that poet was in the room. He was a friend of Lowell's. He described him. He knew the biographies. He knew the work. And he knew the people. It was a, quite a remarkable sort of thing. Um, ambition carries risks. Too much ambition is dangerous. Too little ambition narrows uh, the emotional and imaginative field. It shares space with self-deception. It can cross into grandiosity and occasionally madness, as it did with Lowell. If one punches a hole in the sky, there can be no certainty about what is on the other side. Lowell's behavior at the time he was committed to the Massachusetts Mental Health Center in 1957, just before he was in McLean's and wrote this, the poem, Waking in the Blue, provides an example of the open boundaries. Two facts were clear at the time he was admitted to the hospital. First, he was indisputably psychotic. Second, he had just written many of the poems that would make up Life Studies, one of the most influential poem, book of poems written in the 20th century. The psychiatrist's admission note is particularly interesting in this light. There is undue preoccupation with greatness, Dr. Wollstone wrote about Lowell. Almost a sense of mission in making a new contribution. He has a great need to be not only good, but unique among poets. This need for greatness was established early. He wanted to be a second Dante and actually thought he could be. And indeed, at times, Lowell thought he was Dante. He thought he was Achilles. He thought he was almost everyone who had great power or great poet. His daughter describes a time when she went on the ward. He thought he was T.S. Eliot. And he was reading The Wasteland, taking out every other line, and saying, don't you think it reads much better this way? Uh, <coughs> History lived in his nerves, said Derek Walcott. Um, almost everyone who knew Lowell mar remarked on his affinity for the past. He had an unparalleled historical imagination. Uh, the classicist uh, Robert Fitzgerald said he could hold the world of archaic Rome and the world of contemporary Washington together in his mind. Um, not long ago, a scientist touched the canvas, uh, the car carcass of a baby mammoth that had been preserved in the Siberian ice for 30,000 years. I laid my hand on its skin and felt a chill, he said. I had touched the Stone Age. Lowell laid his hands on history. The past had always exerted a vivid grip on him, said Lowell. His mother, and, and his mother had read Hawthorne's Greek myths to him when he was a child, and the stories fixed themselves to his imagination, just like limpets to a sea rock. Sometimes when I'm trying to go to sleep, he said years later, I can almost feel and touch those people and talk to them. If I read some false modern retelling of the old myths, I would say to myself, this isn't the way it happened. I was there. Hawthorne's fables are history to me, and just as much fact as the earth, the water, and the sky. Fables were history for Lowell, and history was fact. All were earth and water and sky. He took these imagined worlds into him. He drew upon them when he was sane, and fell into them without a map when he was mad. So I just would like to end a little bit on the, the ferocity of manic force. It's very hard for people who haven't been manic or treated mania to realize how much energy is involved. And in fact, it used to be before modern medications, people died not uncommonly from acute mania, um, just from the voltage and the energy and all sorts of uh, associated complications. Um, Lowell's force was legendary. He was six feet one. He was terrifying. I, I know that uh, you would say that he was terrifying now and again to Elizabeth Bishop. He was terrifying to many people. Um, and he would be taken away manic in, six, you know, in, in a straitjacket, put in restraints, um, and it would take six Boston police officers to get him into a straitjacket. Um, manic force is something that runs through the mind, it runs through the body, it runs. Uh, he was 
absolutely aware of his force from the time he was a very young man, determined to try and control it. He read the people who had been, people, everyone from Cahulan uh, to Homer, people who had written about these great uh, forces, uncontrollable forces. And so he- Doctor, I think we need to um, move on to Elizabeth Bishop for a moment. Okay. Just so to, just to we have time uh, oh, sure. in the end to, to have some Q&A. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for being here. I'm, I'm glad that Kay began with that reading from Waking in the Blue. Uh, last night in preparing for today, I was uh, listening at, the, and I recommend this to all of you, there's a, a website set up by the Woodbury Poetry Room at Harvard where you can listen to many readings by Robert Lowell as well as uh, many other poets. Kevin Young, I think, is on there and, and uh, uh, others. Um, but Elizabeth Bishop uh, gave a memorial reading for Robert Lowell um, in 1978, uh, the year before she died, the year after he died, and she also reads Waking in the Blue. So you can hear how that, that poem poem sounds in her voice. Uh, she was a diffident reader, and you might not be terribly impressed by those readings, but you really hear the words as she heard them, and uh, I will also, at the end of my short reading, read a very short poem of hers. Um, listening to Kay talk about Lowell reminded me of, as I was reading her book, some really sharp contrasts between Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell. She was born in 1911, so six years before he. Uh, they met in 1946 when she was 30, uh, 47. She was 36 and he was 29, almost 30, um, uh, at Randall Jarrell's apartment in, in New York. Her first book had come out. His second book was out and about to win the Pulitzer Prize. They were instantly drawn to each other um, uh, and loved talking about poetry, which Elizabeth Bishop rarely would do with anyone else, other poets included. Uh, but the differences were extreme. Kay spoke about um, uh, Lowell's broad ambition, uh, Elizabeth Bishop's ambition, as she wrote in an early story, was to write one immortal poem. <laughs> and she did that, um, probably more than one. Her output uh, in, in her life, a longer life than Lowell's, she had died at 68, was uh, 100 published poems. She worked on them very carefully and over long periods of time. She too selected a mentor, Marian Moore, but she did not write and, and advertise her, uh, her virtues or ambition to Marian Moore. They met uh, in a very um, uh, off, out of the way bench in the New York Public Library and they became great friends and Moore was definitely an influence, but Bishop would never have put herself forward. It took her a year or more to send any poems of her own to Marian Moore. Uh, they were also only children, but as Lowell said, he was an only child always fighting with his parents. Elizabeth Bishop was an only child with no parents. Her father died when she was eight months old and her mother was unhinged by this. So her, her experience early uh, with mental illness, um, living with a mother who was undependable, and then when Bishop was age five, the mother was um, institutionalized. She never saw her again and uh, she died when Elizabeth was a senior at Vassar College. Um, so you can gather some of the differences. And I, I thought, though, rather than read a passage that involved Robert Lowell, there are many of them. He's a great character in, in my book. Um, I would read something else. Now, I began this book thinking it would be a short book. She published only these 100 poems. I had been her student, as I was also a Lowell's student. And I thought I'd be writing kind of an appreciation of Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I always have wanted to write a very short biography you could read in one sitting. And this one is shorter than my other books. Um, <laughs> but uh, I found out right away that there was this cache of new letters um, in, the, in the archive. Um, her late life lover, Alice Methvessel, whom she met, and that's the part I'll read, uh, had saved back their correspondence. So I'm gonna read a section that uh, could not have been written before 2011 when uh, these letters, Alice died in 2009 and then these letters appeared. There were also letters that uh, Elizabeth had written to a psychoanalyst the same year that she met Robert Lowell, although he doesn't appear in these letters. Um, and I think maybe that's something we can talk about later, the use of, of, uh, of uh, material that 
might have been confidential, certainly was confidential in the time, lifetimes of these, um, of these writers. Um, and so I began to see that a whole new biography could be written and I decided I would write this. Um, but I'm just gonna read from towards the end of her life. Um, and uh, this is 1970 and 71. One of many great benefactions from Robert Lowell was his invitation to her to take his spot teaching at Harvard when he decided to go teach in England in uh, 1970 for a couple of years. And uh, she hadn't had much teaching experience and uh, was in Brazil mourning uh, the loss of her longtime lover, partner, uh, Lada Gemesedu Suarez, who had died in 1967 of a of an overdose of drugs, possibly a suicide. The, the relationship had been foundering. But here uh, in this last chapter, I should say, the book is called Elizabeth Bishop, A Miracle for Breakfast. That's a title of one of her wonderful sestinas. She wrote two of them. And if you know the way a sestina works, there are six stanzas of six lines, each with end words of those six lines repeated as end words, ending words um, in the rest of the stanzas in a prescribed order. So I thought I would take as the biographical chapters in, in the book, the six end words from that uh, Sestina as chapter titles. Uh, and they, these biographical chapters are interspersed with my recollections of working with Bishop at the time. Um, so this is from the last chapter, which is called Sun. And uh, it's kind of a word game. You may not really get I'm not gonna read far enough for you to really get why this chapter is called Sun, but, but it's a fun thing about the book. You, you wonder and then, then you find out. So, um, Sun. The poor heart doesn't seem to grow old at all, Elizabeth had written to Alice Methvessel from Uro Preto in Brazil in March 1971, a month after her 60th birthday and two weeks past Alice's 28th. But their age difference was nearly always on her mind. From the moment Alice first laid her head on Elizabeth's shoulder when Alice had stopped in to see her after a beery party with the boys of Kirkland House, where Elizabeth was living in an apartment reserved for visiting scholars during the fall of 1970, and stayed and stayed like a child who couldn't bear to go to bed. Alice Methvessel was the otherwise entirely sensible, slim and athletic Kirkland House secretary with blue, blue, blue eyes and a disposition as bright as the sunny side up formula she used to lighten her cropped hair, who had helped move Elizabeth into her second floor rooms in eye entry in early October, showed her how to use the basement washing machines and soon was handling Elizabeth's mail, meeting her at the airport after a late return from New York City and bringing her home to the fifth floor studio apartment on Chauncey Street where Alice lived just outside Harvard Square. Alice's apartment was the most electrified place Elizabeth had ever seen. Hi-fi, radios too, color TV, Hair dryers, two, electric blanket, electric clock, electric water pick for toothbrushing, along with an electric stove and refrigerator. Just normal here in contrast to Brazil, Elizabeth supposed, as she watched Alice dress for work in the morning from the large blue bed that took up more space than anything else in the room. She'd loved the lock of hair that Alice allowed Elizabeth to smooth back from her forehead and those nice satiny eyelids shut tight as Alice slept. She loved the coffee Alice brought to her now in bed and looking out the window to see nothing but bare branches when Alice drew back the curtains and the sound of Alice's voice, nice and loud and cheerful, as she spoke the words that became their waking up ritual. Good morning, I love you. Elizabeth adored the way you pull on your stockings in the morning, very American, careless and extravagant. And she'd never forget the sight of Alice wrapping her beautiful neck with a bright red scarf against the cold. Later that fall and winter, they would plan ahead for more indulgent breakfasts of croissant francais bon and foamy cappuccinos that Elizabeth taught Alice to make with Medaglia d'Oro coffee. Remember when Medaglia d'Oro was the best you could get? When they parted at the end of Elizabeth's first Harvard semester in February 1971, following a magical weekend at New York's posh Hotel Elysee, which is actually a setting in the group. Maybe you know that uh, Elizabeth Bishop was rather tormented that perhaps Mary McCarthy had, had uh, satirized her and Lotta in the group, and indeed that, those, that couple shacked up at the Hotel Elysee. Anyway, but she was there with uh, Alice. Both were in tears, neither sure that the other's love could last through the seven months before Elizabeth returned to teach again in September. 
Alice, who was used to chatting up Harvard professors and assorted dignitaries passing through Kirkland House, had still been taken aback at your loving little me. Alice was tall. Elizabeth was the little one, but she was so much older and a famous poet. For her part, Elizabeth knew, I'm wrong in every way except as a dear older friend, she wrote to Alice from Uruk Preto, and that you are much too young for me, have many, many things you must do. Surely Alice's admirable practicality would cause her to break things off, to do what's right for you, and I'll know it's right for you, but I dread it terribly at the same time. Troubled by the bows in Alice's past, and having witnessed the attraction Alice held for Kirkland House boys and even the avuncular housemaster, Professor Arthur Smithies, he'd given Alice a book called Nymphos and Other Maniacs for her birthday. <laughs> Elizabeth wooed Alice as best she could in letters she feared were indiscreet and asked her to please destroy after a while. Well, I would never have been able to write this if she had destroyed them. <laughs> She conjured a scene, Alice arriving home from work, where all your electrical gadgets will be waiting for you, and they will turn themselves on and begin throbbing and singing, Alice, we love you, we love you, we love you. Please let us warm your little body and dry your hair and make ice for your bourbon. <laughs> but Elizabeth didn't really have to try so hard. Her sensible lover would not be shaken off course despite the occasional dinner out with Bob the Boring or the sighting of a former beau, Toby. She signed her letters for always, Alice. Well, I just want to close reading a very short poem. Um, Adrienne Rich complained um, in an essay about uh, her literary mentors um, that Elizabeth happened to read and say she partially agreed with, that um, Elizabeth Bishop and Marianne Moore, these eminences that came before Rich, uh, were very reluctant to write about um, human emotions, about the physical, about the sensual. Um, but she didn't know that Elizabeth was actually writing quite a number of very passionate love poems. And uh, these emerged after Bishop's death. Um, and here's one of them. I read it because it's I think one of just two poems in which she mentions books, and here we are at a book festival, but this is a different kind of book. Close, close all night, the lovers keep. They turn together in their sleep. Close as two pages in a book that read each other in the dark. Each knows all the other knows, learned by heart from head to toes. <laughs> there was one stanza that she left out even in that draft, which uh, some people found after her death. And this, this stanza was in, uh, in a notebook. Once in the night, the lovers turned over tightly together under the cover. Thank you both so much. Um, I have to say I read both of your books in the last, uh, I read yours a couple of months ago and I read yours uh, in the last week or so and um, anybody who hasn't read them yet is really in for a treat. They're both um, so magnificent and, uh, and they describe these poets who are such different people and yet whose friendship was so important to both of them. And I wonder if you could each talk a little bit about, about the course of Lowell and Bishop's friendship and what it meant to each of them. And uh, I, you know, they, each book describes in some cases same, similar events or the same event from, from the different perspectives of the two poets. So whoever cares to answer first. Uh, well, you, you know, one of the things that probably could be debated is the influence of each on the other. And uh, one of the uh, important influences, I believe, just from reading the chronology of events is, is Bishop's surprising influence on Lowell to write autobiographically. I mean, he's known as the confessional poet, but it was Bishop's story uh, in the village about her childhood and about the sort of traumatic, her, her mother's scream, the last thing she heard before her mother was taken away, uh, floating over this idyllic um, Nova Scotian community where she was Bishop was living with her grandparents and aunts. Um, uh, Lowell loved this story, and uh, I think it was that, among other things, that inspired him to write 91 Revere Street, his own autobiographical story. And um, 
and to uh, move from there to much more, um, I don't know, nakedly autobiographical writing in his poetry. Bishop never went quite as far as, as he did in that way and was reluctant to. She was someone who had things to hide, things she wouldn't write about, things that other people might have written about, but she wouldn't. And uh, so they, they maintained that difference, but continued to influence each other, even also in the poem, uh, um, uh, the Armadillo, another poem that uh, Lowell read. Actually, I was listening to her reading of it, and she said, well, I, I'm not sure which of us wrote which one first, but in fact, she wrote Armadillo, and then he was struck by that and wrote his own Skunk Hour kind of as an answer to that. But maybe you'd like to answer, too. Um, yes, I think the, the relationship is a striking one because they were so different. I mean, I think he... he he was a very gentle person when he was well, and everybody commented on obvious soft-spokenness, kindness, generosity. He was very generous to Elizabeth Bishop, and indeed she said after he died that she had no idea of all the things that he had done for her uh, because he, he didn't want his name attached to them. Um, so I, I think they were very good friends. I think I, I've always been curious how how much the relationship would have maintained had they been in closer contact. They they were on had the wonderful advantage of of distance, and so the the letters are extraordinary letters. The relationship was you know fundamental and extremely important to both of them. But I also think that um, they would have, whenever Lowell got around her. I mean, I think in a way it, it's romanticized a little bit that he said that this was once the you know the great might have been, but in fact he was manic, and whenever Lowell got manic, he got attracted to anybody, uh, in, in fact, and, and, and usually to, he was attracted to her in a totally different way, but it's, it's, I think that was understandably upsetting to her, um, and, you know, pushed the boundaries, and I think he was, he was better off at a distance from her. Right, and I think um, both of you mentioned in your books that, you know, Lowell's mental illness was difficult for Bishop to be around because Bishop had her own history with her mother um, and that there was some fear there, you know, or just she found it upsetting. If they had been in the same place, they might not have been so drawn to one another, but their relationship was mostly through letters. It, it, it's true. I think also that if you look at who Lowell wrote to about mania, he wrote about it to his male friends and fellow poets who had been manic. Um, I think he understood that Bishop didn't understand his mania. It's a very difficult thing to understand. There's nobody on the planet who, who could really understand it, I think, unless they've been there. So he writes a great deal in his letters to other poets who had been manic. He spared her, I think, and tried to spare her. Uh, she was very supportive, but she also, I think, you know, understandable. Well, a lot of people. You know, it was interesting that in the memorial reading, she chose to read first three poems of his early poems that were his own uh, memorials to ancestors, and then these three poems, including Waking in the Blue, that she said were written under, under or after times of, of duress in, in hospitalizations, and she said, you know, it's the, the uh, miracle was that he would emerge and then write, write great poems. So, you know, she wasn't... Um, I don't think she was not able to understand, but I think she did want to keep a safe distance, and I think that that is understandable. I just I wanted to mention a couple of other acts of generosity of Lowell's that I heard in in his reading uh, from 1975. He was he began by saying, "This is a, these are very good years for uh, writers teaching at Harvard," and listed quite a few. Um, you know, for me, I was there then. I heard this reading. Um, he says, "Most distinguished." oldest is Elizabeth Bishop. Um, and then he says, this is also speaks to the influence, he says, before I did, she discovered how to get natural language into a poem. And that's quite something for him to say. Uh, and then he said some sort of artifice was needed not to make the thing sloppy. So, you know, he was recognizing her use of form and his own occasional, uh, you know, well, Kay could speak more about his relationship to form um, but yeah, you know, she had her own problems too, and this was something they wrote about to each other. I mean, they knew she right. had her I mean, drinking. She, she also, um, uh, you know, had a mental illness. She was de depressed and alcoholic. And um, there, there's a fascinating letter from uh, Lowell to Bishop just after uh, Dylan Thomas had died of his own 
extreme abuse of his body through alcohol and what all those sorts of things. And, and they were both sort of horrified by this. Could it happen to them? Both uh, sort of saying to the other, don't let this happen to you. Please, please live. Live for your writing. Live for, your, for our friendship. And yet they, they couldn't either one really save themselves or each other. No. You know, I, uh, one thing I, I wonder often when I know somebody's worked on a biography, you know, you live with that person for a long time, um, the person you're writing about. And I wanted to ask each of you, when you were done with the book, did you, did you miss hanging out with Lowell? Did you miss hanging out with Bishop? I mean, did you form your own emotional attachment as a writer to the, to the writer you were writing about? Well, in a way, I, I've, as it were, hung out with Lowell since I was 17. So he's been in my life, and he's not going anywhere in, the, in that sense. I, I, I would be deeply reluctant to not think about him a great deal. I've, I started off writing about him uh, with admiration, and I ended up in awe and respect and great, great... Um, respect for his personal courage and his kindness and the difficulties. It was a tragedy. It's writing, it's writing a tragedy when you write Lowell's life. And there's an awfulness to that, the pain and the suffering. Um, but he contended. It, and I, I just, I can't, don't want to get that out of my head. I admire that. Speaking of awfulness, uh, Bishop's favorite line from one of her own poems was, awful but cheerful. And uh, I think she held that up as, as, uh, as a goal, a way of overcoming the awful. This is inscribed on her, she asked to have it inscribed on her gravestone in, in, in Worcester uh, Cemetery. But, you know, I think that both of our books are written in a kind of biographical m mode that I call sympathetic identification. There's, uh, we're very engaged with these characters, um, me somewhat more personally in the case of this book because I had known Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, there's a way that the, uh, without, I don't want to give away this little plot that uh, is threaded through my memoir sections, but um, it, I had not had a, I, I was not close to Bishop. In fact, I had reason to think I had uh, gotten on her wrong side, which one doesn't want to do. And in the course of writing this book, um, I, I was able to write out that story and, and kind of resolve those feelings. Uh, she began our class by saying she didn't believe poetry could be taught. Um, and I think in many ways this book was a, a response to that, trying to, my sense was she was saying uh, a, po a, a poet's work is, comes out of their life. You have to live this, you have to read. She couldn't do any of that for us. And, and by presenting this life, um, I feel that I've kind of answered that, that question, that sort of uh, frisson that we all had when she, we, you know, we showed up, we'd been selected for the class, but what were we going to do, you know? <laughs> Can't be taught. Yeah, exactly. it's so interesting. I, I want to hear more um, from UK, and I know our time is short, we just have about five more minutes, but um, about, you write a lot in your book, not just about Lowell, but about um, the sort of broad history of mania and how we've understood mania. Um, and you, you, you sort of attack the, the notion of, um, you know, is it a romantic notion that craziness and genius go together, or is there something really to it? And I, I know that you mentioned that the, the, the research isn't really 100% there yet, but you feel that it's sort of getting there. I want to hear you talk more about that, about the relationship between, um, certain, between mania and creativity. Right. Well, I think it's a pretty strong one. I think you have to say that most people who are creative clearly are not manic, okay? And most people who are manic clearly are not creative. So that's, it's rather that there's a very striking increase. And this has been anecdotally observed, which is, has no scientific basis, but anecdotally observed for thousands of years. In recent years, in the last hundred years, there are probably 60 studies in the last 10 years, these are studies of hundreds of thousands of people, in a couple of cases, a million and a half people. These are increasingly rigorous studies, and they all go in the same direction. A very much elevated rate, of, particularly of bipolar illness, in highly creative populations. 
Um, and the question is, you know, is it, it, at what stage of the mania does that happen? At, that people who have bipolar illness are also disproportionately likely to fail. So you have this kind of group of highly successful people with bipolar illness and a group of people who are very unsuccessful and who have earlier onset and, and so forth. So I think it's a very strong finding. There's a recent very interesting work in genetics looking at this, um, much more work in neuroimaging. So it's, it's no longer just doing biographical studies. I mean, several of us have done biographical studies of looking at cohorts of 100 people or doing studies. I did a study of 50 the top poets and, and uh, writers in England and looking at treatment histories and effects of moods on season, you know, seasonal patterns and all that kind of thing. But the, the recent studies are really long, uh, large, and, and so I think, I think it's real. I think the question, interesting question is why, in that we know that there are a lot of ch fundamental changes in the way the brain processes um, words and information, and, and words just become more fluid when you're mildly manic. Uh, your number of creative responses to words are, are three times as uh, high, um, the number of original words. So there's something in the brain that is very work and all sorts of other things too. It's a very complicated relationship. Uh, I, I think if I were to say there were sort of uh, larger issues that you could track through my book, aside from reading this great life story, um, there, this is a story of someone who, who struggled with alcoholism from a time when, you know, maybe it could be cured through psychoanalysis to a time, uh, sadly, stopping short of the sense that Alcoholics Anonymous or a number of things could have been helpful. Uh, I learned that she was advised to go to AA and her lover at the time, uh, this was in the mid-60s, they both said, I don't want to end up in a church basement with a bunch of winos off the street. We're not going. Whereas... I was able to meet one of her uh, still living lovers, this, this person who told me the story. She said, if I'd known now what I knew then, uh, I, I'd have taken her there right away. But beyond that, I think one of the things that's so striking about this life, uh, Elizabeth Bishop, we now know from these letters, knew uh, very early on that she was attracted to women. She was a girl and a woman who loved women. And that was never anything she was trying to change. She nev did not go to the psychoanalyst to try to work on this. Uh, she found a psychoanalyst, uh, several of them, who would support this, or at least not work against it. Um, and I was very interested to write about a life that was lived in this way, but still in the closet. She was not, you know, the, the history we know of, of uh, gay men and women tends to be, you know, gay rights, who's going to stand up, who's going to wave the rainbow flag first. Uh, she didn't want any part of that, and yet... Uh, she persevered. She had a great deal of joy in her life, as obviously Robert Lowell did too. Uh, and I think that's something that needs to be known and that can be seen in, in the course of this uh, rather magical, if troubled, life. Yeah, I mean, they both, um, I mean, Bishop's relationships with her psychoanalysts is fascinating to me. You know, these were deep, important, creative relationships in many ways. Whereas Lowell, you know, as you point out, um, bounced around from doctor to doctor and hospital to hospital. He didn't have a lot of continuity of care. If there was one person who cared for him more than any, it uh, was probably Hardwick. Uh, in terms of being in you know, on top of his, his mental illness. Um, and yet both of them, both Bishop and Lowell really wrote through their illness. And Lowell uh, dealing with it as, as subject matter more directly, Bishop not, but they both, uh, they both showed extraordinary bravery and courage just kind of keeping going after falling down, each of them, so many times. I think there's a lot of stuff that we didn't get to, but I think we have to uh, break here and clear out the room for the next one. Thank you so much, both Thank of you, you for beautiful. Uh, if